Kem. I am 23 years old and I am from Jos, Nigeria. I am the CEO and co-founder of Valley B. I'm Benjamin Baisisiru. Uh, I'm 32 years old from Accra, Ghana. I'm the CEO and co-founder of TraderX Ghana Limited. My name is David Jonjo. I'm 38 years old. I'm the COO and co-founder at Grow Greek, and I am a proud Kenyan. My name is Raul Fossi. I'm 37 years old, and I'm the founder of a young startup company called Skyview Solutions, based in Douala, in Cameroon. My name is um, Karim Amir. I'm 29 years old. Uh, I'm co-founder and CTO uh, of a startup called Visual and AI Solutions, uh, or Vase as we call it. My name is Imadre Abiora. I'm a medical doctor. I'm co-founder and CEO of Health Botics Limited, the creators of Lendanol. I'm 28 years old and I'm from the state here in Nigeria. My name is Ryan Katai. I'm age 26. I'm from Zimbabwe and I'm the CEO and co-founder of FarmHeart. My name is Fangana Ade, 29 years of age. I'm currently one of the co-founders and CEO of Shopa a B2B e-commerce business here in Africa. My name is Udubinga Gubali. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Grandmaster. I'm 32 years old, I'm from Nigeria. Um, Grandmaster is based in Ibadan, Nigeria. I'm Felix Masharia, CEO and co-founder at Kotani Pay. I'm 29 years old and I come from Kenya. On today's special edition, we have a conversation with the judges and learn from them what methodology they used to narrow it down from 1700 to 10, then to the three finalists. For more, I'm joined by six distinguished guests, Timothy Nzioka, Director of Program Operations for Africa, U.S. Africa Development Foundation, Leila Ndei, Senior Vice President of Business Strategy and Government Affairs, Saibashan, Edu Abasi Chinuoke, Startups Lead West and East Africa for Microsoft, Rick Wad, Senior Vice President of Strategic Alliance and Outreach, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Yusa Omoireva, Manager KPMG, and finally Dr. Wendera Yao, Executive Director of the U.S. Africa Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Africa Business Center. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, special edition. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I guess uh, let me start uh, with you, Dr. Yao. Uh, let's start by you maybe telling us a little bit about uh, the Well, Paul, thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Well, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, in collaboration with uh, uh, USADF and uh, Microsoft, uh, Sebastian, a number of uh, host uh, partners, uh, initiated this competition to really spotlight uh, talent uh, in the innovation, digital innovation sector. So the chamber started this whole initiative about a year ago, since the beginning of this year, uh, like you said, we started with uh, close to 2,000 applicants from 50 countries. Uh, we drilled it down all the way to top 10, uh, the top 10 that was just uh, shown. And now we, we are uh, at the point where we're going to determine the champion uh, from the top three that has been identified. And, and of course, this was done with the help of our eminent judge that uh, we have here on, the, on this call. Uh, let, let me now turn to, to the judges. Let's start with you, Timothy. Uh, Timothy, uh, you are probably one of the few people here who is privileged to have had the, the opportunity to fund these people, to fund this competition. Uh, from your vantage point, uh, what is it that, that you're looking for uh, out of this competition? Thank you, Paul. And um, an excellent question. So USADF as a US government agency that provides um, capital uh, to uh, young and entrepreneurs and SMEs, as well as uh, technical assistance. Uh, what we look for is impact at grassroots level, 
And this opportunity is another platform of trying to identify um, innovative solutions that address some of the uh, common challenges facing communities in Africa. So as USADF, we were looking for things that address uh, common needs, whether it is in the tech space, whether it is in agriculture, whether it is in health, whether it is in wash, and whether it has got the capability of uh, going into scale so that we can meet um, the needs of uh, millions of African people. And as we are going to see, uh, some of the the, 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 the the enterprises that were presented, I would say they were all winners. While we have got three top, all the other seven are winners because they presented cases where there's opportunities um, uh, to deliver solutions uh, to communities. And as an organization, we availed $10,000 for each of the 10 uh, finalists. And then the five uh, top regional winners, uh, they, 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 they are getting an extra $5,000. And then the best, uh, the one that came on top will have an additional $25,000. Uh, the second top will have 20,000 and the third top will have 15,000. So in total, USADF has put together an investment of $185,000 uh, that will go to support these young entrepreneurs realize the dream of uh, taking the solutions to the market. Uh, Leila, you bring uh, a very interesting uh, uh, perspective uh, to this uh, conversation. Uh, you are one of the judges, uh, but uh, uh, the kind of feedback we got uh, from a lot of people, they were saying that there were not a whole lot of uh, females uh, featured in this program. Uh, you, your expertise is in strategy. What can you do to help young women on the continent maybe to strategize uh, better to be able to compete in some of these uh, competitions uh, for example, that uh, just uh, concluded the competition where very few women uh, participated in it. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, before I uh, answer your question, I would like to congratulate all the participants in this uh, competition, but most specifically the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for organizing such an unprecedented initiative. And of course, our partners, uh, the, the private U.S. private sector, and the Cybastian, as you may know, is an American company specializing in cybersecurity with footprints in several African countries. And um, it is really my pleasure to have, uh, you know, participated as a jury uh, to this uh, competition. As you may know, globally, the level of uh, female participation in the innovation sector is low. So it is in Africa. So Africa is not an exception. And uh, in Africa, more African uh, women are into entrepreneurship and fewer are into the STEM sector. So many obstacles uh, that uh, we have observed in Africa for, for women not being part of the uh, IT uh, revolution, fourth industrial revolution. Uh, one of the uh, impediments are definite, uh, is definitely uh, the lack of information, lack of skill set, lack of access to financing and uh, which brings women at uh, not as competitive uh, as men so what is Sebastian doing addressing these challenges Sebastian is uh, has opened several centers of excellences uh, in sub-saharan africa and uh, we have really we are pri we are proud uh, to say that uh, we would like to promote more and more young women uh, into the sector by giving them access to training in the cybersecurity space and making sure uh, that uh, all of them uh, benefit from the same, uh, I would say, the same uh, opportunities as African men on the continent. As we've seen in this competition, only one woman made it to the uh, finalist. And uh, I hope, it's my hope, that time for the next edition that we have more women 
involved into this competition and also more francophone African women because uh, as we've seen uh, francophone Africa was kind of absent in this competition and uh, let me seize the opportunity to say that as tomorrow we are celebrating the Wells Entrepreneurship Day let's make uh, ourselves a commitment to promote more women in the ICT sector thank you uh, your voice is well taken, and uh, we say uh, we welcome those uh, 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 those voices, especially women are participating in these uh, uh, events. Uh, Rick, uh, your forte is into partnerships. Uh, you leverage on building partnerships with uh, a lot of these uh, younger people across Africa. Uh, what uh, when I talk to some of these uh, young people, they say what they are lacking is not. Uh, the skill, but they are lacking partnerships that can take them. Uh, I believe that partnership and relationships, uh, mentorship, sponsorship is very important uh, when growing and expanding opportunities for entrepreneurs. And I think one of the key components of this competition is the ability for the United States Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest business organization, to bring the mentorship and the uh, 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 allyship to these young entrepreneurs. And that's very important because relationships do matter. And I want to also congratulate all of the competitors uh, who competed in this competition. All of them are winners in bringing the innovation and bringing the technology, not just to create businesses, but solve complex problems that are confronting the people of Africa and around the world. And so it's extremely exciting for the United States Chamber of Commerce to be a partner with the young technology entrepreneurs across the continent of Africa. And we look forward to continuing to develop this relationship and bring the mentors to help these companies succeed and to grow and prosper. Uh, Edu, Edu Abasi, uh, you are in a unique position here. You crisscross the continent are looking for uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, you have uh, done so much on your end, uh, courtesy of Microsoft. Uh, what is it uh, that uh, uh, was unique about uh, this competition? And when you're looking for young people, what are the special skills or the special things you look for uh, to be able to support them as entrepreneurs? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think for us at Microsoft, when we're looking at young people and we're looking to support them as entrepreneurs, for, it's, a, it's a lot around building a scalable solution. So beyond, um, it's more around how do we scale you up to build a scalable solution? How do we even think of, so when you think of the startup ecosystem in the continent, it's been a very thriving one. And so key for that for us is how many unicorns, for instance, do we have? Um, out of Africa, or how many unicorns do we have, and how can we impact the continent that we keep converting more startups from a scale up from a series C into a unicorn into a unicorn. And that has been one of the primary reasons why we have our motion and the strategy that we deploy today in the continent. So key to our strategy is um, we provide technical resources for the startups who are looking to scale. Um, technical resources could range from cloud credit. So when you think that every startup that is building a product will need a leverage on how to, on the platform of choice to build that solution. And those those kind of platform come at, at a cost. But what Microsoft is doing for the continent is that we're providing that free in addition to every other um, other resources. So from the tech cloud credit to um, collaboration tools that any startup would need to um, office licenses or even email exchanges, we're providing all that for free. But I, for us, even core to it, beyond the technical part of it is, we are hands-on helping them from a business development standpoint. So we're taking startups who are successful in a particular market and saying, oh, if you've done this in Nigeria, for instance, it can be replicated in Kenya, it can be replicated in Cairo, it can be replicated in South Africa. So we are also very hands-on on helping those startups take their product to the market. And we're also very hands-on in helping those startups go through their fundraising exercise. 
So we are something that we have um, realized in the continent that is very pertinent to the growth of startups coming out of Africa is the fundraising. It's been giving them the ability to assess funds. And thank you um, to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for what what you've done in this program in the in the competition that we had. Um, I mean, I would say that we wish we could have more of such. But in addition to that, for us is there are other types of funding buckets available that the startups can assess. And so part of what we do is how do we help them? How do we enable them? How do we prepare them and open those resources and avail it to them? That's something that has been key for us as Microsoft. Uh, this, uh, uh, Omo, Omo, uh, you had the privilege of uh, looking at this from a totally different uh, perspective uh, you are the person in charge of the gate. Uh, you are the gatekeeper to make sure that everybody in the process felt safe. Everybody felt like they were part of a credible uh, system. Uh, what did you do uh, to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, people walked away believing that this was a credible process and everybody who deserved to be there was there? All right, thank you very much. So um, part of our goals in, um, and the, um, values in KPMG is um, integrity. So we're happy to um, partner with the US um, Biz, um, America Business Council to ensure this particular project, you know, is um, very, very objective in the scoring. Um, so part of the things that we did you know, to uh, assist this this project was for us to, you know, be part of all of all the decision making process during the judging stages. So we performed our roles to observe um, the various um, metrics that were used to um, evaluate the various uh, um, candidates, and it was a very very interesting process. Um, also, we we would. It was it was independent the, the platform that was used um the 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 timing the various stats that were put in place the into the decisions in the long run to come to a conclusion of the finalists that we have um uh, uh, during the competition uh, where, where, where where very 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 interesting process so we would like to to to, to congratulate the um um the the finalists and also would like to say that um, this and many more uh, opportunities should be given in um, to individuals who are also interested in going into a project and doing more innovative um, 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 tasks in the in this particular region. So we are happy to support the U.S. Um, um, Chambers of Commerce to continue in this kind of project. And then we are also happy to be the the gatekeeper, like you mentioned, in this kind of instance. So it was a very, very interesting process. Uh, but uh, let's take a quick uh, break. I will be, uh, and when we come back, we'll continue with the conversation. The search is on for Africa's best and brightest minds in finance, cybersecurity, technology, and anything digital. Making social impact through cutting edge technologies, innovation, and creativity in Africa. Out of 17,000 candidates from 50 countries in North, Central, East, West, and Southern Africa, only three will be selected from the top 10 continental finalists from Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Cameroon. Join the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and its prestigious partners, including the Voice of America, when the three finalists are featured at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in December 2022 in Washington. Stay tuned. Okay, so, so let's open up the conversation then. Uh, let, let's start uh, with uh, maybe, uh, and feel free to jump in if you want, if you will. Uh, there are a lot of, there is a lot happening on the continent uh, when it comes to uh, innovation, when it comes to technology. Uh, but when I talk to a lot of people, they say, 
we are, we have not even touched the surface yet. There's so much opening on the model. Um, all of you guys have had the privilege of being part of this movement, uh, the tech revolution in Africa. Uh, let me get your thoughts on what you think about where this revolution is going. Uh, anybody can jump in. And uh, the power of the digital economy on the continent. Uh, right now, when he's talking about close to 187 billion, uh, you know, 5% of GDP. Uh, and this could, uh, could actually increase in the next uh, 30 years, you know, to 700, more than 700 billion uh, industry. Uh, so I think it's important to put the ecosystem uh, in place and to allow uh, the startups to, to have access to finance, access to all the critical information uh, to thrive because they are truly the backbone of uh, the economy on, on the continent. Uh, if you look at start again, you know, just the startup were able to raise five billion uh, last year, uh, and it's poised to actually increase. Uh, so we, we see that increasing trend, and it's very important that uh, we continue to push it. That's what uh, the U.S. Chamber believe in, and we've been uh, doing all our best uh, to continue uh, to support the startups on the continent. Thank you. Before Leila, Leila leaves, uh, let me ask her one quick question. Leila, uh, earlier you talked about uh, how uh, there is less uh, participation from the women on the continent. Uh, what do you think really needs to be done to address uh, uh, some of those uh, challenges? We have a lot of women entrepreneurs. We have them in Silicon Valley. We have them in Africa uh, uh, creating things. But unfortunately, they are not featured anywhere. Uh, what do you think can be done to maybe uh, rectify that? Thank you, Paul, for, for the question. As I said earlier, uh, at our level, talking about Sebastian, we are really uh, striving to hire more and more women on the ICT sector, specifically in Africa. And uh, if you look at the leadership, I'm one example, for example, uh, I'm an African. Uh, and I am at the executive level of an ICT company, but most importantly, in Africa, we hired a lot of women engineers uh, in most of the countries where we are, and we're in eight countries, and we are training more and more African women into the, into, uh, the STEM in the industry. So I think training is one thing, and the other, other thing uh, I would say uh, is access to information, because uh, access to information is one, and giving the women the, um, I would say, the confidence so that they know that uh, it is an accessible field for them. Because most of the time, uh, African women, they say, okay, they are entrepreneurs and uh, they are good into the agriculture sector, they are good into trading and etc. cetera, but they, we don't make enough the promotion of uh, the ICT sector thinking it is uh, a sector that is not uh, the best fit for them, which is not true. So there is a campaign that needs to be uh, to be done, you know, so that people, women feel more comfortable embracing the sector of activity. Let me throw this to uh, the other lady on the panel, uh, Edu Abbas. Uh, I, I was I was going to speak. I was actually going to talk, whether you called me or not. I was going to comment on that. Okay, sure. Go for it. Go for it. Um, okay. So, um, thank you, Leila. Um, I mean, because this is something that I am personally very passionate about, right? Um, beyond what I do at Microsoft, I own I own an organization called Wentworth, um, which has a, a focus on getting a lot more women into um, into tech. Until date, we've been able to get over 5,000 women across the world into technology. Something that we've also found out from our research has been, um, in addition to what Leila has said, but it's also been a missing puzzle around mentorship. So a lot more women who are looking to get, a lot more women who are looking to get into tech and not seeing other women who have gone into it and have done phenomenal for them to sort of to sort of role model them and so because something that i've also really noticed was there's a whole lot of initiatives around let's get more women into tech let's get more women into stem but it does not necessarily translate to the number of women that we are seeing in the workforce 
and so for me it's like there's obviously like a case of what i would say like a leaky pipe somewhere there is a funnel coming with let's get more women into stem and it's not translating to the number of women in the workforce to the number of software engineers that we have that are women and so something that we have deployed and we've seen to have worked for us as an organization is mentorship so getting women who are experienced in tech who are already two years three years four years in their career getting them to be um, getting them to mentor um final year students in school those who are beginning their tech journey so that we can they can continue to grow in it and don't have to drop off and then likewise is also getting women who are already in leadership position mid management positions to also mentor the ones that are coming up in the ladder in the ladder so that we can get that spaces filled up quickly but it's it's a work in progress and um and, and as, as much as we have a lot more people who are passionate about it and are passionate about the course i think in the next few years so thinking the next three four five years we would begin to see a significant change in what is um in what is happening in that space uh, there are some analysts who have said that uh, uh when it comes to africa the intellectual balance of power has been shifting in our favor you have more young Africans educated who come to the West here, get a college degrees up to PhD level, and they go back. So in terms of uh, human capital, Africa is doing very well. In terms of uh, uh, innovation, Africa is doing very well. That's why you see a lot of tech giants going into Africa, investing into, uh, into Africa. They want to tap into that raw talent. Uh, but uh, from your vantage point, uh, anyone can jump in. Uh, when it comes to funding, why is it that uh, uh, in most cases, there are very few uh, people in that sector who get funding, especially in most cases, it's either in Nigeria or Kenya or South Africa. Uh, other places really, when it comes to funding or uh, getting venture capitalists to invest in their, in their startups, it's not there. What's going on over there? I think just jumping in here briefly um, is the fact that um, a lot of investors are looking for mature uh, investments where they are going to be getting returns. But slowly, slowly, we are getting more entities, institutions that are not only looking at uh, cash benefit, but looking at social benefits which include impact at the grassroots level. The thing that we look at in terms of transformation, uh, things that are going to transform the world, as we know our world is changing so fast today. Uh, we are just coming out of the COVID situation. While COVID presented a lot of challenges, it also produced a platform for innovators to come up with new ideas of tackling that specific problem. And then you find financial institutions and investors that were saying, okay, we want to follow these innovations. We want to see where this is going to land because it is going to prepare the world for, next, uh, for the next upcoming pandemic, which is likely going to be here with us in the coming, uh, in the coming years. Again, when you look at the effects of climate change, a lot is being seen, and we have got young people, talented people, who are coming up and saying, we need to come up with new techniques that are going to address, especially people who are living at the bottom of the pyramid, people who are underprivileged, people who do not have opportunities, and we are getting more institutions that are saying they want to put the investment at that level because it is going to cause transformation. It is going to cause impact. It is going to change the way people are And those people will gradually then become a pipeline for commercial investment. So if we can uh, nurture uh, a lot of these organizations and provide opportunities for them, making it making it easy for them to invest then what i believe so that i conclude what i believe is that uh, these institutions will then make investments not just philanthropically but in ways that they cause impact in ways that they help these innovators to become a pipeline 
now for the commercial investment. So there are opportunities for us in the coming years uh, to have more uh, come to play in this field. Uh, how about uh, you, Rick? Uh, since you are the money man, uh, you uh, you help to fund a lot of projects in Africa. Well, Identifying those uh, partnerships. Well, I will say this. This is not a problem that's unique to the continent of Africa. The number one issue facing African-American and diaspora businesses in the United States is access to capital. So it will require business and government working together to get more capital flowing to young entrepreneurs. We don't have a lack, a shortage of entrepreneurs. We have a lack of capital flowing. So we are working very closely with all of the lending institutions, the private equity, and even government to unleash more capital to young aspiring entrepreneurs on the continent as well as in the United States. And this is why I believe that partnerships and relationships are so important. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, even in the United States, 41% of African-American black owned businesses in the United States closed as a result of the pandemic. And one of the reasons was because of lack of funding and capital, because a lot of enterprises, particularly startups, have to rely on their own personal money as opposed to funding from venture capital, private equity, lending institutions, banks, etc. So we have to bring more businesses, more partners from the financial services industry into the conversation to understand the value proposition is not just the right thing to do, but there is a business case in creating and supporting more African-owned companies and entrepreneurs and startups across the country, across the continent of Africa, because you're solving problems that not just affect the continent of Africa, but they're solving problems that affect the entire world. So that is the way we're approaching this as the world's largest business organization. And I look forward to, again, bringing more United States partners and global partners to bring more capital to these young entrepreneurs across the continent. Uh, Yusa, you want to weigh in as well? Sorry, I can't. I can't hear. Um, I can't hear you, um, Mr. Paul. We, we can't hear you. I don't know what's up with your mic. Maybe Paul, when we are waiting for him to come on, there's something else that I wanted just to underscore that um, in Africa, a lot of SMEs uh, are not able to pitch for their enterprises. So while they have got good innovation, while there is opportunity for them to get funded, they are unable to present their innovation in ways that can uh, attract interest uh, from investors. And one of the critical things, like what USADF does, is not only providing capital investment, but also training and technical assistance. And this technical assistance coming on board that help the SMEs to understand how what are the what are investors looking for? How do you pitch for your investment and uh, and SME so that you link um, the, the 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 demand and supply? And we have seen this work perfectly well uh, because then these SMEs are now able to approach uh, commercial investors in ways that they are becoming more and more attractive. Uh, you you, you want to weigh in? You're live. Turn on your mic. Okay, go for it. Go for it. You're on. All right. So I didn't get it. All right. So um, I think if it's on the issue of funding and tech spaces in Africa, I think um currently africa is you know the uh, more like a green area where tech is really proliferating um and then we can see we have various top, um companies that are tech driven um coming from africa we have a lot of seed funding um with top 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 companies in, in africa so um Number one for me would be that this is a space where um, funding and proper FDIs would be really, really um, requested. Uh, and I believe that it is a space that is um, green for people to, you know, invest in. So I mean, um, I would like to think that um, no, okay. um, 
the innovation that we are seeing that is being pushed forward by the US and American Business Council is mm -hmm. just one angle to all that um, areas that we look into. It's also something that will spur more innovation in the sector. It's not something that will spur more desires from real investors to look to, to Africa and to ensure that, um, uh, um, you know, for next and plunge into the um, opportunities with respect to tech in Africa. That's all I can, I can, I can speak to that. Well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've run out of our time. Our time is up. Thank you again. Thank uh, VOA for this partnership. Uh, and to say that the U.S. Chamber is really committed uh, to bringing the voice of the uh, entrepreneurs out. Uh, we are extremely excited to have those top three uh, contestants coming to D.C. Uh, 